Greetings. Hello. Welcome to PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series. It's good to be back after a bit of a summer break. My name is Caitlin Rose Seiler, and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today, Jordan Rustad from the Last Mountain Lake Bird Observatory will be speaking about Last Mountain Bird Observatory, 30 years of songbird monitoring in the prairies. Before we begin, I'd like to state that we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations and communities, past and present. For a millennia, they have worked to protect these landscapes and the life these areas sustain. I'd like to thank these original caretakers and acknowledge the ongoing work and presence of Indigenous peoples in Canada today. And just a few notes before we get going, I'd like to mention that PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series is a monthly presentation about anything to do with Native Prairie conservation or species at risk. And I'd like to invite you to join us on Wednesday, September 27th for a webinar presentation about the Ecological Gifts Program by the Canadian Wildlife Service, Environment and Climate Change Canada. On October 12th, in celebration of World Migratory Bird Day, we'll be hosting a webinar about wetland conservation is for the birds, foraging, diet, and insecticide exposure in prairie swallows by Mercy Harris, a recent Master's of Science Biology graduate from the University of Saskatchewan. And as always, you can register for these webinars through the PCAP website. And a reminder to our listeners out there, if you have um, any questions, just type it into the questions section of the webinar dashboard um, at any time, or you can send it, there's a Q&A section, otherwise you can send it by chat. Uh, because we have almost 200 people registered, everyone will be muted for the duration of the presentation. Um, and feel free to upvote other people's questions if you have the same one, and questions will be answered towards the end of the webinar. And finally, I'd like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by our presenting sponsors, Canadian Forage and Grasslands Association, North American Helium, Nutrien, Saskatchewan Cattlemen's Association, and SASTEL. In-kind support has been provided by Nature Saskatchewan and the Last Mountain Bird Observatory. So without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce today's presenter. Jordan first began volunteering at the banding station when she was 17. And since then, Jordan has been working as the field manager at LMBO and has worked with conservation nonprofits in Saskatchewan doing a bit of everything from bird surveys, habitat stewardship and outreach. Jordan is currently completing a Master's of Science at the University of Regina, focusing on urban wildlife. And I'd like to mention that Jordan was the winner for Saskatchewan for the Young Professional Stewardship Grant um, at the prestigious Prairie Conservation Endangered Species Conference in February 2023. So with that, I will pass it over to you, Jordan. Thank you very much, Caitlin. Thank you so much for having me here today. Let me just share my screen. Okay, there we go. There. Well, without further ado, like Caitlin said, my name is Jordan Rested and I am the a field manager right now at Last Mountain Bird Observatory. Bird Observatory. And so kind of give you an idea of what to expect for today's presentation. I'd like to just talk very briefly about what is bird banding, just in case uh, people aren't too familiar with it. And I wanna kind of explain like what data we actually collect and how it is used. Uh, then we're gonna like really dig into like the history and significance of LMBO and all the birds that we catch. Uh, some of the cool things that we've seen over 30 years of monitoring. And just to give you a little snippet of what kind of to expect and the future of LMBO and kind of where we're going. So first off, uh, bird banding is very simply placing a marker on a bird to be able to differentiate it from other individuals. And so you can ban birds in a bunch of different ways. You can use like color bands, but the uh, bands that we use specifically at LMBO are aluminum bands with a unique nine digit number. And this is what is used primarily for songbirds all over North America. And theoretically, um, all of these aluminum bands are coming from the US uh, Fish and Wildlife and all of our data goes back to there. So if you ever find a banded bird, theoretically, you only have to look into a single database to look that up. And so in order to catch these birds, we use something called mist nets. 
And this is what they can look like on a really busy day. Uh, mist nets are basically just um, a, almost like a really fine fishnet. And they uh, form little pockets over tight lines called trammels. And so the idea behind them is they're placed in between hedgerows. And because they're so thin, birds don't see them as uh, they are uh, flying from one, one tree row to the other. And so the squares are specifically designed to fit small songbirds so their head and their shoulders go through, but their bodies can't. So they hit the net and then they kind of hang in the net like this until we come and extract them. And we do check these nets every 30 minutes just because we this is a stressful experience for the birds and we try to um, reduce the time that we spend handling them as much as possible. So once we get them out of the nets, we put them into small bags and bring them back to the lab. And this is what the lab can look like on an extremely busy day. Thankfully, it does not look like this uh, very often, uh, but we'll uh, bring the birds back and we'll hang them up on, uh, hang them up and start working on them. And so what our data collection includes is putting on that band number and recording that nine digit number. We'll try to age and sex the bird and I'll kind of explain like how we do that. We also take wing length, fat scores. We'll look for a breeding care, any breeding characteristics the bird might have. Uh, we weigh the bird. We keep track of what nets there we get them out of. And we'll additionally, sometimes, not all the time, do molt scores, tail measurements, record anything out of the ordinary, or even collect tail feathers. And I'll go into a little bit of detail on all of these. And just like very generally, we ban birds because it gives us an idea of population structure. So a lot of um, estimating of bird populations is done through breeding bird surveys. But for a lot of the birds that we are catching at Last Mountain Bird Observatory, they are boreal breeding warblers. So to count them on their breeding grounds is logistically difficult, if not impossible sometimes. And it's been shown time and time again that um, migration monitoring is a good, is just as good as breeding bird surveys for estimating population sizes. And we can also get an idea of migration routes. So what paths these birds take uh, during migration, it lets us get an idea of how long birds can live for in the wild. And a really famous um, example of this is Peace the albatross, who is now over 60 years old. She has outlived her original bander, and I think she even like laid an egg still last year. It was crazy. Um, and another thing that banding does, it's a really good opportunity for public education for people to come and see birds and learn about uh, migration and songbird uh, conservation. And so the different data that we collect is used in different ways for different studies. First off, we have age, which we determine by using what are called molt limits. So molt is an annual cycle that birds go through and they basically lose and regrow their feathers. And the simplest explanation of it is that birds that are born this year, so hatch year birds, molt differently than birds that were born at least last year. And so the placement of these limits and their absence or presence uh, kind of is what we're able to use to age birds. And this blue jay is actually a really cool example because you can really clearly see the replaced bright blue feathers versus kind of those retained juvenile feathers, which are more gray and they just aren't bright and blue. And you can use age in population trends. Like for example, if you are catching a lot of hatch year birds, so birds that were born this year, um, it kind of tells you that the birds probably had a really good breeding year and the, um, the population is likely to increase in coming years. Uh, we're also able to determine sex of certain birds and usually we do this by plumage and I think lots of people will know this like a lot of bird species the male is like really brightly colored versus the female is a little bit duller. And we can also occasionally sex birds by using a uh, wing or tail measurements as well. And figuring out uh, sex helps us to determine 
population structure as well. So kind of that female to male ratio. Uh, Cause essentially in like statistics, like females are like what's important to predict if a population is going to increase or not. And so say one year you're catching a lot of females, then you can predict that the population may increase versus if there's very few females born that year, the population may decrease. Uh, we, some of the data that we collect gets us an idea of body condition. So we're able to combine wing lengths and weight to get an idea of like how healthy that bird is. It's kind of like the body mass index, but for birds. Um, we also look at fat scores. And so birds basically only store significant amounts of fat during migration, and they store it at the base of their throat. It's called the furcular hollow. And because their skin is translucent, we can actually see through and we'll see that yellow fat against the red muscle. And you can kind of think of fat like gas in the tank of your car. The more fat a bird has, the farther they can migrate. We also check for any breeding characteristics. And this includes uh, brood patches in females or cloacal protuberances in males. So what you're seeing on the screen is a picture of a brood patch. And essentially birds will like, a like female birds, uh, will pluck some of the feathers off of their belly and the tissue becomes like vascularized and wrinkly. And it basically becomes this perfect little heating pad for the eggs. So it's used to keep eggs and nestlings warm. And in the spring, so males will develop what's called a cloacal protuberance. And essentially birds like, rep like reptiles have what is called a cloaca. And so birds pee, poop, ejaculate, lay eggs all out of their cloaca. And so in the spring, the male's cloaca becomes engorged in order to aid sperm transfer to the female essentially. We also keep track of what birds are coming out of which nets. And this gives us an idea of habitat selection during migration, because some of our nets are a little bit more open, like our more southern nets are right beside a marsh and in kind of a more sparsely vegetated hedge uh, versus our more northern nets, which are in a really thick, dense carragana hedge. And we actually do notice that we catch slightly different species here. Uh, in the more open area, we can occasionally catch a few like marsh birds because there is a marsh just right across the fence from the nets. Uh, more sparrows, kind of like more like more open country birds versus the um, thicker hedge. We catch a lot of warblers in there. And then occasionally we'll collect like a bit of additional information on the bird. Like if an adult bird is in active molt, so birds will molt uh, pretty sequentially. So they'll, we're able to um, kind of see like where that bird is at with its molt. Like sometimes we'll get birds in active molt. They're not very far along or they are really far along. And that gives us an idea on if they're getting ready to migrate or if they are ready to migrate. Because if you are lose, if you don't have all your feathers, it's a little harder to fly, a little harder to migrate. Um, we'll also sometimes take a tail measurement and we'll only need it for like cases for like difficult identification or for sexing the birds. Like for example, you are actually able to sex barn swallows based on how long the fork of their tail is. We'll also kind of note anything out of the ordinary if the bird has parasites, deformities, um, if it's replacing feathers in a weird way, anything like that. And we also occasionally will collect uh, tail feathers for stable isotope studies. And I will cover that in a little bit more detail later on. And in addition to the banding, we also do a daily census, which is basically a, a walk on a predetermined route, uh, just to get an idea of what birds are around, but not necessarily in the nets. We also collect incidental and casual observations. And again, that's kind of what's maybe around the nets, but not in the nets. And the combination of banding daily census and the incidental and casual observations, make sure that we're getting like really um, complete coverage of the birds that are moving through the area. We'll also like occasionally take notes on other biodiversity. Like if we see 
a bunch of toads like this year, for example, has been really great for toads for whatever reason. So getting into um, the history of the station. Um, so we were established in 1989 by the lovely Alan Smith when he was still with the Canadian Wildlife Service. And so we are, we're in our 34th, uh, 34th year right now. And that makes us one of the longest continually running stations in North America. There are a lot of stations that are technically older than us, but we've never had any um, interruptions for spring or fall coverage, which is really cool. And, um, and the station has been run by Nature Saskatchewan since uh, 2007. And we are also one of the like pilot members of the Canadian Migration Monitoring Network, and that was since 1992. And this Canadian Migration Monitoring Network is essentially a network of stations, and we all use the same or very similar protocols so that we're able to compare uh, the data that we're collecting and to create uh, national uh, population trends. Uh, the CMNN also engages in some really cool, like large scale research projects with the, um, the stations all over Canada. And so this is a map of all of the stations in Canada and LMVO is the one with a star over it. And what you'll kind of notice right away is that there are a lot of stations um, out east, particularly around the Great Lakes. BC and Alberta have okay coverage. And then in the prairies, <laughs> there's only a couple stations. And so Saskatchewan is a really, amazing place to bird and to watch migration happen because we actually have three different flyways that pass through the province and so we potentially get western um, and eastern and those central birds as well and just a bit of a close-up of the area and this is something that confuses people a lot because there's a lot of things with the name last mountain lake in it. So we are technically within um, uh, Last Mountain Lake Regional Park. And the park is completely surrounded by the Last Mountain Lake National Wildlife Area. And where people get confused is there's a bird sanctuary, a wildlife area, a regional park, and us. And so if you're ever wanting to come visit, uh, look up directions to the regional park, that will get you much closer. Lots of people end up going to the National Wildlife Headquarters. And so as of now, we've banded almost, if not over 100,000 birds of 125 species. And we generally average 3,400 birds of 76 species per year. And that is for our spring and fall monitoring. And we're open in the spring from May 8th to the 31st. And then we open in August after the long weekend until October 9th. And uh, our daily average tends to be about 50 birds, but we have had days where we've gotten up to 400 birds in a day. And just a few of the birds that we are catching. So a, our number one capture of all time is the yellow rumped warbler. And we can catch hundreds of these guys in a single day. And the subspecies that we catch in particular is the myrtle warbler. So, and a big difference between the myrtle and Audubon subspecies here is that um, the color of the throat in myrtles, it's like white and in Audubon's it's yellow. We also catch a lot of yellow warblers. And we've even come close to breaking the longevity record for yellow warblers. I think we were just a couple months off of beating that record. We also catch a lot of Tennessee warblers. And this is one of those fall warblers that give a lot of people trouble when learning to identify. This is thankfully a breeding male, so it has that nice uh, gray head and bright green body. 
And these guys are kind of cool because they are in a very similar niche to this species, the orange crown wormler. And so you actually see very distinct uh, migration windows for these two species. You tend to get Tennessees earlier in the season and then orange crowns kind of come through later on. We also catch a fair number of least flycatchers and uh, trails flycatchers. And because this, and because the station is um, kind of in that zone where you can get willow and alder, because willow and alder used to be considered a single species called trails. And the only way to really distinguish them is by sound. And so when we catch a bird that is likely an alder flycatcher, we still have to call it a trails unless it sings in the hand, which I think has only ever happened once in the station. <laughs> Um, we do catch like a fair amount of warblers. This is one of the uh, local breeding residents. This is a common yellow throat. But we do catch a lot of these boreal breeding warblers like this chestnut sided. And just to give you an idea of how different the, these birds can look at in the fall versus the spring. Um, we also catch a fair number of Canada warblers and these guys are actually a species at risk. Uh, I believe the current status is <laughs> threatened. Uh, we also catch uh, palm warblers, very specifically the Western uh, subgroup. Uh, we catch, and we have been catching a fair number of magnolia warblers as well. Uh, these guys are really fun to catch and they're fun to identify in the field. They tend to be very active and they look like um, little bumblebees, honestly, with that bright yellow and the black streaking. And they're one of the few warblers that have that white um, all throughout the tail. We also catch like a fair amount of morning warblers. Like we get an insane amount diversity of warblers here at the station. And we, um, these guys are kind of fun to catch because you don't, see them in the field as much because they tend to be those really skulky birds that like to hide in the bush. We'll also catch a few uh, black Bernie and warblers. Uh, people might be more familiar with the uh, the males like that bright orange. It looks like a little flame in the trees. But this is what an immature bird looks like. We'll also catch one or two black-throated green warblers a year, which is really cool. And we don't catch them very often. Like we usually see them because they tend to uh, hang up a little bit higher in the canopy. So they're less likely to be caught in the mist nets. We'll also catch a fair amount. Well, no, that's a lie. I'm sorry. Uh, this is a, a black-throated blue warbler. And this was only the uh, eighth uh, one caught in station history. I wish I could say we caught a lot of these guys are really cool. And something really cool that we only catch from time to time is a loggerhead shrike. They tend to hang out in the regional park in the spring, but completely disperse by the time we come back here in August. So you can see these guys in the park in May, but you'll have to explore the National Wildlife Area if you want to see them in the fall. And so that is just a few of the birds that we catch here. And so we have found like some general patterns um, here at the station. And so these are from the 20 year report. And this is kind of generalizations made off of a more of a local or regional scale. Uh, just like you wouldn't apply trends that you're finding in Ontario to Saskatchewan, we're not gonna apply them elsewhere. And I'll also have a few slides of kind of what we've been finding in recent years, because things seem to be a little sh shaken up. So a big thing we found is that for a lot of birds, they have two main strategies when migrating over the prairies. Uh, they either like build up a lot of fat while they're still in their in the boreal forest and they fly over the prairies in one big hop so they don't stop over, preferably 
or you have birds that build up a little bit of fat and kind of hop from island to island. And what we found is that most birds are only spending a day at LMBO before very likely migrating at night. And we know this because the majority of birds are not recaptured on subsequent days. And so this seems to indicate that birds don't necessarily want to stay here. Uh, it's very specifically being used as a stopover site to get from one point to another. Uh, and this also seems to, the site also seems to be less important during spring migration. Uh, birds stop less during that time and they seem to only stop if they get pushed down by bad weather. And so for the birds that are stopped over here for longer than one day, it tends to be adults who are in active molt. Like I was saying, like if you are missing feathers that you need to fly, it's gonna be a little bit harder to migrate. So you might stick around for a few days. Uh, it also tends to be inexperienced birds that were hatched that year. Um, and for certain species, they almost seem to stay longer, but not by choice. So it seems like LMBO tends to be a refuge in poor weather, or it acts as a migrant trap for some species. And a really good example of this is the oven bird. Um, these guys tend to get stuck here for a few days and they seem to struggle to put on enough fat to leave. And this is um, in comparison to similar species like the northern water fish, where they're able to move on relatively quickly. And so LMBO is a large treed area on the prairies. Uh, we have the lake on one side and uh, prairie and farmland on the other. So it kind of creates a little bit of a, a funnel effect. So the birds are kind of uh, funneled into LMBO because it is one of the few places where they will be able to forage and find food. And something that may contribute is really large hatches of fish flies or diptera. And I can tell you that there's massive hatches. Uh, sometimes like when you're walking down the net lanes, you can't talk to the person right beside you because there's so many flies. Unless of course you want like an extra protein snack. But anyway, and for the birds, so returns. So these are birds that are recaptured at LMBO or elsewhere in a different year. And so the average um, recapture rate is 2.1%. And so that is quite low, which is why it's important that we collect a lot of different data so we can use it in different ways. Because if we were only looking at recaptures as the important part of banding, then this seems like a really low number, right? But, um, okay. And so that's kind of like generally what we have found over a few decades of banding. And for, uh, through 2020 and through 2022, there seemed to be um, a change in weather pan patterns. So the weather tended to be a lot hotter and a lot windier. So we lost more days than average, but that was kind of offset by a higher than average bird, higher than average like bird birds caught per net hour. Uh, we also managed to add five new species within those that three year period. And just to show you how much that capture rate has changed. So we have the average capture rate from 1992 to 2019. And that was around 600 birds per 1,000 net hours. In fall 2020, it was pretty quiet, just slightly below average. Then in 2021, we had over 1,200 birds caught per 1,000 net hours. And that's a doubling of what our average is. And fall 2022 was still above average, but not nearly as high. And based on what we've caught so far, um, we are very much on par to what was happening in 2021. So even though we may not be able to open the nets as much, we're still catching as many birds, if not more. And so 
because this is a very like short term thing. Um, I kind of have like a few theories about why this is happening right now, because long term trends suggest that bird populations are not necessarily increasing. So what I think is happening is it's a potential bottleneck effect where there are fewer uh, fair weather days for birds to migrate. So, you know, you just get bigger clumps of birds all at once. I also think it might have something to do with fewer islands um, because like many because like as agriculture kind of scales up, there's fewer hedgerows. So there's fewer little islands for the birds to kind of hop to. So I think they're just kind of being extra funneled into LMBO. And with that combination of reduced islands and fair weather days, we're getting this large increase in capture rates. And to give you an idea of some of the stuff that's been found na national, so this Canadian Migration Monitoring Network has some really cool um, tools that you can actually look at through nature accounts. And so I'm just using the yellow rumped warbler as an example of this. So you're able to look at long-term population trends for individual stations. And so this is the one for LMBO. I'm not really sure what happened in 2013, but um, like for yellow rumped warblers, you know, they're doing, you know, okay. And you can do this for a lot of, uh, basically for all of the stations where they have sufficient data. So this is for Beaver Hill. And you could also do this for Long Point or McKenzie Nature Observatory, like a lot of other um, banding stations. You can also look at interactive maps. And this kind of shows you uh, where there have been significant increases or decreases. And so the blue dots are stations where there wasn't any significant changes. Um, the large red arrow show greater than 5% decreases. Small is less than 5%. And then the green arrows is where there was um, increases. And you can do this for um, any species where there is significant data. You can also look up like when you can reasonably see birds at a given station. And so there's a lot like happening on this graph, but the red lines are essentially the window that the banding station is open. The gray line is like the likelihood that the nets are open on a particular day and the station is operating. And then that curved line is just kind of like your probability of like, are you going to see birds? And you can see like for LMBO at least, kind of our peak is almost always mid-September for yellow rumped warblers. And you can look at all of this in a lot of detail um, on nature count. So if you just like Google Canadian migration monitoring, it takes you like through the statistics they use and how they create these trends. No, we still don't hear you. Not sure what happened there. We were hearing you loud and clear until just right now. How about now? Yes, perfect. <laughs> okay. There. But um, okay, so sorry about that. I think, I don't know what happened. My headset just disconnected from um, the computer. Uh, but anyway, so we also participate in feather collection studies. And so we will collect a couple of tail feathers for stable isotope analysis. And you can kind of think of stable isotopes as essentially like different flavors of the same molecule. And so for most of the studies, we're looking at hydrogen. And typically, um, hydrogen exists along a gradient. As, as, and as you go kind of farther north, uh, the heavier that hydrogen is. And so these uh, stable isotope studies kind of help us determine breeding areas for birds because that's where they typically grow their feathers. And it helps us to estimate a catchment area for stations. So where are the birds we're catching, where, where are those birds coming from essentially? And just to give you kind of a clearer picture of what this looks like, 
we catch the bird, we collect the feather, and then we're able to use that um, hydrogen gradient and get an idea of where they were caught. And so this is an example from a really cool paper that is actually available for free online. And so it shows the catchment area for LMBO because this was a very large, um, a stable isotope study uh, that was done. And it kind of gave us an idea of like where we are catching our birds. And you can see like we're catching um, from very far west all the way to like central Saskatchewan, which is really cool. And a something really cool that they have found that was done with uh, black pole warblers. And so black pole warblers are uh, really cool because they're a really long, um, long distant migrant. So they might they breed anywhere from like Alaska to Ontario. So there's three uh, distinctive groups, kind of the west, the central, and the eastern species. But they all migrate to the east coast and fly a little bit over the ocean. And so uh, a stable isotope study was done on these guys. And then it was compared to wing lengths to see, because theoretically, the longer uh, birds are migrating for, the longer their wings should be. And they were actually found that it matched up relatively well wing length to where these birds were breeding, which was really cool. Something else that they have started doing with uh, stable isotopes is looking at mercury content in feathers. And so this is actually a uh, we're actually currently collecting feathers for a mercury content study as well as a stable isotope study. And this paper is, is unfortunately not available for free online, but what they found is essentially Western birds had less mercury than Eastern birds. And they think it has to do with kind of um, the amount of industry and the amount of like disturbance in a given area. And so kind of like some future stuff that LMBO is getting involved with uh, will be um, adding in um, MODIS monitoring. And that's essentially like radio telemetry. So we'll be setting up stations similar to the picture here. And then um, if you have a bird that has a MODIS tag, it basically dings off of the tower and it tells you that bird passed through. And so we're hoping to uh, have our station operational this fall and start tagging birds in some smaller projects, but we'll kind of see how that goes. And we're kind of looking at long term too, and we're really hoping we'll be able to continue banding songbirds for another 30 years out here. So after listening to all of that, I know you're like super jazzed and everyone wants to come and visit. So we are completely open to the public for visitors. Um, if you are a large group, you can get in contact with uh, my supervisor, Shannon Chernick. If it's just you or a small group, so less than 10 people, you can just get in contact with me. And if you're wanting to come explore the area, uh, there's tons of driving trails in the wildlife area. Uh, they've just put in a new observation tower as well. And in the regional park, there's also a lot of maintained trails and another um, observation tower where you can actually see the, uh, the breeding colony of pelicans and cormorants fairly well. And if you are interested in volunteering, we have a relatively open door policy. We don't require that you pay anything or have any memberships. Uh, the only like hard requirement is you have to be at least 16 years old. And we ask that you're enthusiastic and willing to learn. And I just want to uh, thank um, a lot of our staff and volunteers who make this possible and whose enthusiasm <laughs> makes me want to continue banding for a long time. And if you're interested in supporting us, maybe you can volunteer. You can donate to us through Nature Saskatchewan, or you could buy our merch. We still have a, a fair bit of these uh, blue um, LMBO hoodies um, available through naturesask.ca. Uh, but with that, um, I will um, open the floor to questions. 
First of all, thanks so much for the awesome presentation. You're so young, but you have so much experience and knowledge. So yeah, thank you for sharing that with us today. Um, we do have a few questions that have come in. So the first one, what is the oldest bird that you've seen in Saskatchewan? Ooh, Saskatchewan. Um, that's a really good question. I think the oldest bird that I've seen was probably that yellow warbler. It was almost 11 years old. Because mm -hmm. like, essentially, like the bigger a bird, the longer it generally lives for. So for a, a bird that weighs less than a loony to be able to live for 10 years after migrating thousands and thousands of miles, it's pretty much a lifetime achievement right there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and what is the most unusual bird, like one that's not supposed to be here that you've caught? Um, I think the most unusual was the indigo bunting that we caught in 2017. Hmm. And, and so that was one of like the first, if not, it was the first banding record for the station, if not the first for the province, potentially. And another really cool one that's a little bit older was a Cassin's Vireo. That was the first ever record of the bird at all in the province. And it was captured here at the station. Wow. Oh, that's interesting. So the first ever record. And yes. when was that? When did you say the Cassin's Vireo was? 2002. Sorry, I have okay. a small audience here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, that's okay. I was just wondering if like maybe it had something to do with climate change or why you think it found its way here or just got lost. Yeah, like a lot of birds just kind of, you know, get tossed around in storms and they end up in weird places they shouldn't be. Like I think there was like someone reported like a Rufus uh, hummingbird right near Nokomis this year. And that's one that probably, you know, just got blown in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Um, so some of our listeners are wondering about um, the public times of when they can go to the banding station during the fall migration. Um, do you have any events or set viewing times? So we are open to the public every day, weather permitting, of course, uh, from 10 till 1. And we're still asking like people just give us a heads up if they're showing up and it just kind of lets us because if we do have a big group showing up and then just a smaller group shows up it lets us kind of let you have a better experience essentially you can actually see the birds without 30 other people in front yeah. of you <laughs> yeah that makes sense um do you ever band hummingbirds and if so what is the latest date that you've seen them pass through in the fall so um, hummingbirds require very specialized training and equipment. So the bands that we typically use, you just kind of open them, uh, put mm -hmm. them around the bird's leg and kind of close them again. And it's like a little bracelet. With hummingbirds, you actually have to individually cut out the bands from sheets of aluminum and then wrap it around the bird's oh, leg. Wow. And because and because hummingbirds have such a high metabolism as well, you have to have like sugar water on hand to feed them. <laughs> and so we don't typically catch uh, very many of those. And if we do catch them in the nets, we more so like make a note of them and just send them on their way as quickly as possible. Okay. But I usually like the latest uh, that we get hummingbirds is like late August, like early September. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't very many in the park this year. I think we've only seen one and it was this past uh, Saturday. Okay. Interesting. Um, during um, COVID, did you notice any changes like maybe having to do with reduced plant traffic and bird counts or anything like that? Um. So for like us at the station, um, we were very lucky because we're in a semi remote location. So we were able to continue uh, banding. And I'd say our numbers were slightly below average for that year. Uh, and we couldn't have visitors at that point and very reduced volunteers. So I think yeah. 2020 for the birds was not like a crazy year by any mm -hmm. means. It was more so a crazy year for the people. 
Yeah, yeah. And what about with all of this wildfire smoke that we've been experiencing? Have you mm. noticed um, any impact on the, your bird counts? So I think the wildfires might also be playing a role in kind of our increased capture rate, because 2021 was also a really bad uh, smoky year. Yeah. And so... Like, I think we've also noticed a few, like, really early fall migrants. Like, on the first day, we were already getting uh, yellow rumped warblers and roofy crowned kinglets, which is something we don't usually see until, like, the towards the end of August, beginning of September. And the ruby crowned kinglet that we saw and caught was actually a hatchier bird. So it was incredibly early this year. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, and do you do any owl banding at all? Um, we only do owl banding quite sporadically. Okay. Um, it's not, LMBO isn't the greatest place to band owls, but if we do band them, we're specifically targeting northern sawwood owls. Okay. And why is that? Um, it's kind of what we are like able to do and it's what species are likely to happen here? Like um, we do get like great horned owls and there's actually yeah. a long-eared owl that uh, bred here in the park this year. But um, with the mist nets that we have, so kind of the material and the staff that we have, we're able to, when we do have someone on staff with a valid uh, owl banding permit um, and who has the capacity because you can't be up um, up till three at night and then get up um, at seven to band <laughs> songbirds as well. Uh, it wears you down very quickly. Yeah. But um, for sawwood owls are just like kind of an easier one because you are able to set up your nets very similar to how we have them already. Mm -hmm. And the lure is relatively simple as well. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so there was somebody interested in coming to visit or volunteer when you're doing owls, but it sounds like if it's sporadic, that would be hard to pre-organize. Yeah, <laughs> I generally, because we, well, we catch like an extremely low volume typically of owls as well. So we don't usually like open to the public if we do, because we mm -hmm. might catch one if we're lucky. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and there's just a request if you could share your screen again about how people can get a hold of you about visiting. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, perfect. Maybe we can leave that up for a few minutes and people can jot that down. It's probably right at the end. Yeah. There we go. Perfect. So they can get a hold of you there. Yeah. Um, so there's a few people who are interested in bird banding. Um, and there's someone who's typed in that um, they have a cage type sparrow trap um, mm -hmm. for use with a bird feeding station. And sometimes they get other birds um, from time to time and would like to be able to band them before releasing them. And they're all unharmed. Is, is there any way that people can start banding birds on their own? So in order to ban birds, you do have to get a permit from um, the federal government. And in order to get that permit, you have to show essentially that you are um, proficient in the birds that you are attempting to catch and that you will basically be able to operate the trap that you want to operate and be able to um, uh, ban the birds that you are potentially catching. So if you want to get involved in banding, the best thing to start is to um, go to a banding station mm -hmm. um, and start volunteering. That way you can learn how to handle them, how to age and sex them properly and kind of build up your numbers. And once you have that, that's when you can apply for a permit and start banding yourself. Okay, that makes sense. And how long did it take for you to become so confident as a bander? And this, this isn't even my question, but I am also curious too. <laughs> well, I would say I started feeling confident around like year seven, I would yeah. say. Okay. Because um, the other thing about the station, because we get like, because like some people like focus 
like really hard on like one or two species that they're banding and that's like all you have to learn versus we're potentially banding 125 so you have yeah. to know a lot of species and because we're also like a relatively high volume station um, most years and so you have to um, get out the birds kind of as quickly as you can like typically when I'm processing a bird like a good rule of thumb is to be able to process a bird in a minute or less wow and yeah so I think I think by year seven I was like okay I'm feeling really good and now like I've started like teaching a bit more and I'm like okay I feel like I've got this now <laughs> Good for you for being so dedicated. We really appreciate it. <laughs> um, there is somebody who's asking about um, the mist gnats. Do birds ever get injured while they're in there or get preyed upon by another species while they're there? Yes. Yeah. So unfortunately, like because we like are catching wild birds, there is like a potential for them to be injured. But um, typically like um, if you are hitting injury or mortality rates of 0 0.05% or is it 0 0.5? Anyway, it's like half a percent. If half of your, half a percent of the birds that you are catching are getting injured or dying, that's, you have to shut down and reevaluate your methods. And so we're like very cautious and we make sure like properly trained staff are holding the birds. And when we are training people, it is under... Um, extremely close supervision because that's usually mm -hmm. what happens if a bird gets injured. Um, it's either because they're just being taking, taken out of the net improperly or like someone is just being like a little too rough with them. Yeah. And then for like predators, um, yeah, like a bird hanging in a net is a great opportunistic snack for <laughs> Yeah. Um, animals walking by and so we have had issues with weasels in the past uh, with owls and hawks nearby and even a deer <laughs> one time oh, but yeah yeah but yeah <laughs> if we see any of these predators around the net we immediately close yeah yeah you'd have to wow I was not expecting a weasel or deer <laughs> but that makes sense I know <laughs> Um, and the last question that we have at the moment is um, about feeders. So people that are feeding birds, is there a time of year that they should put them away specifically for hummingbirds or? Um, for hummingbirds, um, once you're not seeing them anymore, you can really like safely put them away. Mm -hmm. Like, um, like as long as you're like maintaining your feeder like really well, especially like hummingbird feeders, you're keeping it clean and you're changing out the food relatively regularly. You can just like keep it out and monitor it, kind of check if you are getting, if you're still getting hummingbirds, you're welcome to keep it up. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, well, that's all the questions that we have right now. Um, so I just um, want to thank you so much for for this awesome presentation. Um, it's been really interesting. <laughs> I, I personally didn't know a lot about bird banding. So yeah, this has been really great. And um, I know a lot of people have written in too to say thank you and how informative the, pre um, the presentation's been. Um, and somebody's just asking, is there a park reference for Rowan's Ravine? So the park I'm talking about is Last Mountain Regional Park. Okay. Okay. Last Mountain Regional Lake. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Lots of people, again, wonderful presentations. So interesting. So I'll just reiterate those comments there. Um, so thank you, Jordan. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, it's been lovely. Um, so I want to let all of our listeners know, thank you so much for catching today's webinar. We have one coming up um, about the Eco Gifts program, and that'll be taking place in September. And then don't miss one about swallows in October, planned around the World Migratory Bird Day. Um, and if you miss something in today's webinar, it will be put onto our YouTube channel in the near future. Um, or if you know someone who would have loved it as much as you did, then you can share it with them as well. Um, hopefully today or tomorrow. Tomorrow. So we'll see how fast my rural internet lets me upload it. <laughs> um, and then when you leave today's webinar, there'll be a quick one minute survey. If you don't mind filling that out, that would be great. And it helps us keep our native prairie speaker series webinars going on into the future. Um, so with that, thank you so much, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.